I think one of the saddest things about the modern world, and partly a result of television, is that people live in a tiny time slice of the present moment, which they ca carry forward with them, but uh, nothing remains. And there's nothing in their experience which, which reverberates down the centuries, because the centuries to them are completely dark. Just unillumined corridors from which they stagger into the, the single little sliver of light. You can try it? Yeah. Because we'll go to the music later on, but right, to yeah. make sure that the moment you are playing... Well, just to see, see what... It's not a very good piano and it's quite hard to play, so... Um was a bit softer or is it all it's it's only when we close the, the, the top? It is closed, as close as it can be. This is a very loud piano unfortunately. Is that, it's that's as, as soft as you can make it. Yeah. It was the first time you saw your wife. And you I, I, I first saw my wife out hunting. I was introduced to her just two, three years ago. When I flew back, I was teaching in Boston at the time, and I flew back here one Friday night from and to go hunting on the Saturday morning, and we were introduced out in the hunting field. I didn't really pay much attention to her, except that four weeks later I fell off my horse, and um, and uh, she came and helped me and picked me up and put me back on it again. So we became very good friends then. And um, gradually I came to feel, you know, this, some of her naturalness began to rub off, off on me. You, know, you so discovered her slowly. Yeah. And yes. vice versa? Hmm? Vice yes, yes, it's very slow, quiet. Um, respectful courtship. Um, but I always, from the beginning, felt that she did embody some of the serenity that I was looking for.
Don't worry about them. Good boy. He's snorting because he's frightened of the instruments. It's all right. Yeah, we're not coming too close. Good boy. Now tell me, Darren, the distance. When I wrote you my invitation letter mm. uh, to participate in Beauty and Consolation, yeah. uh, you reacted, well, come on a day that we are do, doing the hunt. Yeah. Why? What's the relationship? Between the two. What are we doing here right now? Uh, here, well, <laughs> the consolation for me is what we're about to observe, which is this uh, you know, return to some kind of natural condition mm -hmm. uh, of the sort which I, a civilized man has detached himself from. And my own view is that the search for beauty actually is an attempt to rediscover that condition which we were in once before separating ourselves from the natural order. And hunting to me is a... Returning to a kind of purity, a kind of uh, okay. But also being part of one species and not existing as an individual only. Mm -hmm. All our unhappiness and alienation comes from the attempt to be an individual above everything else. Whereas consolation comes when one relaxes into a sense of something greater than oneself. That is one species life and also the whole of history and eternity which that represents. Mm -hmm. And you, can, you do that in conjunction with animals because they already exist in that species life. This, this horse, for instance, is immersed completely in his species being. That's why he's frightened of you lot. He's not frightened of me because he's known me from hunting. And we go side by side into these great animal adventures. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lose our individuality together. An individuality which he, in fact, never fully had, but I always have. Now, don't worry, Sam. I shall talk later, I think, about beauty and its place in yeah. all this. But well, I'm talking specifically about the hunt now. Yes. Well, th the hunt also has um, a beauty to it. Yeats famously said, how but in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born? And of course, the hunt is a very good example of the attempt to make beauty be born through custom and ceremony. It's a, a ceremonial event in which death itself becomes part of a ceremony. And without the consciousness of death, there can never be beauty in any case. So this is our way of, as it were, feeding that primordial experience of living and dying in a collective group into their own need for, the, for, for beauty as a human artifact. You will see, I think, from the ceremonial aspect, that this is an attempt to recuperate the natural world for our human experience of beauty and to, to revitalize that experience of beauty. And this horse now has calmed down completely. He's quite used to you now. Good boy, Sam. He's actually a very intelligent horse, this one, which is not How a very... Notice? Hmm? How do you notice? That he's Compared to the others. Yeah, he stood and worked it out and realized that you were not dangerous and, you know. Well, that's intelligent, yeah. Yeah, that's as, that's quite, as intelligent as a horse can be. So, are you I, going? I should think we should um, have another little look at the other horse, perhaps, and then I'll get the box around. Ligt voor ons. Roger Scruton zal urenlang op de vos jagen. Nog weet hij niet dat het beest door zo'n 40 mensen, 40 paarden en 40 honden niet zal worden achterhaald. Maar die verrassing bedoel ik niet. Scruton is een eminent filosoof, als geen ander vertrouwd met 20 eeuwen filosofie. Het enfant terrible onder de filosofen bovendien. Intrigerend, maar ook uit die hoek zal de verrassing niet komen. Hij is conservatief, maar ook daar zal de verbazing niet direct opduiken. Die komt pas bij wat hij zal zeggen over God, over zijn jeugd, over de troost van de filosofie en tenslotte over iemand die de hele film aanwezig is. 
maar die we geen seconde te zien zullen krijgen. Mm. Problems. Zo uit de stuurt. Dat is Ik ben een beetje oud, deze box. Ik ben wel een nervous bij de camera. Consolation is iets dat we, human beings, seek. Maar we zijn de enige animals die seek this peculiar, abstract kind of home. Andere animals zijn niet in need of consolation, ze zijn in need of food shelter, warmth, and so on. So what is this strange extra thing that, that we hunger for? It isn't simply physical comfort. It's a sense of being fully at home in the world. And uh, this seems to imply that in much of our lives, perhaps most of our lives, we are not fully at home if we spend so much of our efforts in seeking consolation. Mm. Whereas it were sundered from our nature and from the world in which we live, in a state of what used to be called entfremdung, or alienation, but perhaps that's a little bit pompous we're putting it, but at least in a sense of uh, wandering, that we're, as it were, detached from what we truly are. And these experiences of homecoming are incredibly important to us. They're the things which give us the sense that, after all, it was worthwhile, all that struggle that we went through to maintain ourselves as individuals and to show off to each other as individuals, to pursue individual uh, pleasure and individual uh, success. All these things put us at variance with ourselves as well as uh, uh, inspiring us, so that this, we, there's a, a need in all of us to come back to what we truly are and, and rest there. And I, I take it that's what we mean by consolation, a kind of if you like, transcendental homecoming. Mm -hmm. Homecoming from all the bittiness and fragmentariness of our ordinary experience to some condition of peace and reconciliation, of being with the world and with each other that we don't normally possess. Being at peace with the world itself. Being at peace with the world itself and therefore with ourselves. Now, it's very easy to see in this, of course, the uh, inherited religious longing that we have. We are not only the only animals that need consolation, we're the only animals with a religious sense, the only animals who have, have a conception that life on this world is in some way incomplete, needs to be completed by something. Even in this irreligious and pagan age, this desire to complete our, work, our life here with something that is, as it were, not here but beyond mm -hmm. is just as strong um, uh, of course, it has expresses itself in other ways, perhaps in, in ways that we didn't wouldn't naturally approve of. But nevertheless, it's always there. And um, to understand our desire for consolation, I think one must look into the roots of the religious sense. And um, to me, uh, uh, this. Oh, shall I stop there just for a moment? No, just come on. Yeah. If we're talking about religion. Mm and consolation in the religious sense. Right. Yeah, the, the, the roots of religion lie obviously very deep in us. That there is, in all of us, this need to establish a connection with something greater, something which is not me, uh, it's not you, but in some way comprehends us both. And uh, being a part of a universal drama. Perhaps being that. One of the main characters playing mm. in it. Something yes, like being that. part of a drama, but also <coughs> the drama of one's own life, but, but also united with others in um, a community which is, as it were, beyond the living, mm -hmm. beyond the community of the merely living, which absorbs us into the full uh, epoch of the species including the dead and the unborn. This is something that modern people in particular hunger for because they have been, as it were, nomadized by their civilization. They've been set in motion by, uh, first of all, the ease of movement from place to place, the ease of movement from one emotional relationship to the next, the ease of uh, movement 
simply from room to room and from thought to thought, from entertainment to entertainment. Nothing stills them or keeps them in one place for long enough. And yet, all the time that this movement is occurring, the hunger is growing more and more urgently within them to bring it to a stop or to stand back and be at one with things, be where they are, resting, dwelling in the land, as Heidegger would have put it, uh, attached to the, to the place which is theirs and at peace with the people who are theirs. And this is um, absolutely essential to us. It goes d deep into our species being. It's something that we've inherited, obviously, from many millions of years of evolution. And our sense of the divine is in to some extent a projection of this, but also a recognition mm -hmm. of our inability to create this on our own. We cannot alone, or even in a small group, create this sense of home. It's something that's given to us, inherited, and passed on. And I think the tragedy of our century is that people ha have lost the habit of inheriting it, and have lost the habit, therefore, of passing it on. But not everybody. Now, going back to fox hunting. I take this as a, a, a small example, but also a symbolic one, of a way in which people have made themselves at home in a territory. They've established a claim over it and um, given themselves a kind of relation to each other which is deeper in the species than the mere day-to-day -day relations of work, pleasure, entertainment and television watching. It's something which they themselves wouldn't be able to put into words, but nevertheless uh, touches what is most urgent in their being, the thing which all of us really, in the end, live for, which is that moment outside everyday activity where we are simply at rest with the world. And, um, of course, it's not insignificant that hunting is part of it, because this is what we as a species fundamentally are. We're hunter-gatherers mm -hmm. for whom our ultimate sense of social, uh, a social unity comes from the act of hunting together in a tribe. Not that, as you can see from, <laughs> from the way it is, a fox hunt is like a hunting tribe, but it has a lot of that uh, ur lameness that the, um, no, that the hunter-gatherer lives through. All oh, right, so... Mm, yes, oh dear. That's terrible. So no hunting this season. Here are the hounds. Oh, look at that. Yes, I'd love a sausage, thank you. I'll introduce you to the master, the, uh, who's here. This is the one in the red coat, Bill Reed. Good morning, master. Good morning, Roger. Friedrich Engels, who was the great fox hunting Marxist. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Yeah. <laughs> Been absolutely rooted to this little piece of land all their lives, and have always related to the local economy and also to the wildlife. They are part of the wildlife of the region. You know, for them, hunting is absolutely essential because it renews their attachments to each other and to the soil where they are. And if you look at their faces, they're wonderful pictures of what human beings really are when immersed in their species life. Aren't you romanticized? Yes. Well, that's so are you. I mean, the whole program, the whole idea that beauty is a form of <laughs> consolation belongs to the 18th century, doesn't it? Yeah. But if you just put the camera on their faces and you will see what I'm saying, it's not, it's not a myth. These are not the same kind of boring, flattened, television-saturated faces that you see in city streets. And these are people whose noses have just been, as it were, pulled out of the ground with the imprint of the earth still on them. 
and that, that for me is a very important experience. We may not have this experience in the future, but then we may not have the experience of beauty either. I think just these old boys here, well, all that little group, you know, they're here every time, and they come to talk to each other and to renew their social attachments and also their attachment to the place. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with the modern world, in my view, is that people no longer dwell on the earth. They move nomadically around it in search of something they know not what, never finding it, moving from person to person, place to place. Internetting. Yeah, internetting. Yeah, metaphor. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Whereas these people still uh, dwell, as Heidegger would say, in Wohnen, in the land. Yeah. And that is something which, um, I mean, I'm not a great fan of Heidegger, but it's one of the few things that he said which is absolutely true, that only if we learn how to dwell can we build, and only if we build can we actually live with each other. And the secret, that's the secret of real architecture. That's why Amsterdam is beautiful, it's still a place of dwelling, it's built as a place of dwelling. Mm -hmm. But of course, modern architecture is hideous, largely because it's an architecture for nomads who sweep through it like a wind, like pieces of paper on a on a wind and then disappear. So that, you know, if, if you're to understand beauty, you have to understand experiences like this, this attempt to, to reaffirm your connection with a particular place and a particular time and a particular social web. There's a kind of Marxist approach also in what you're saying. Not everything the, that Marx the, said The autarctic way of life, the common people, yeah. being uh, the symbolization of beauty and consolation of Consolation no, means it's a little bit dangerous. Uh, yeah. You Dutch are always afraid of things. That's the trouble. I'm not afraid of no, okay. Every serious idea is dangerous. Yeah. But um, you know, when in a civilized mind, it is not. It's an instrument of peace. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about peaceful existence in a single place, an unthreatening form of being. Uh, and um, you know, maybe. There's something true in Marx. What is true in Marx is what comes to him from Hegel. You know, that, that there, in all of us, there is this desire for homecoming, heimkehr, of, about which Hölderlin wrote so beautifully. Uh, and that is where consolation resides, where we find ourselves having ventured out into all these dangerous experiments of individual living, at last coming back and f swallowing all our pride and humbly acquiescing in a social order which is bigger than ourselves. And that, and that's what this is all about to me. How do you feel hunting? Being together with your mm. horse. There is the togetherness with the horse, which is extremely important because you're <laughs> it, it, not only the horse, but also the hounds. It, for them, this is a, an experience which is also extremely social. They're returning to their, their species life, running with the herd or with the pack in a state of extreme elation uh, and uh, ecstatic excitement. And, um, and yet, peaceful too. It's not a, they're, they're not, at least the, you know, although of course the hounds are in the business of trying to catch a fox. And their relations to each other are fundamentally cooperative and peaceful, mm -hmm. as is the relation between horse and hound, or between human and hound. And because of course these creatures do not, like us, suffer from a deficit of consolation, because they have no conception of what consolation is. There is a, a kind of consolation in being so close to them that you, as it were, uh, set aside that uh, sense of loneliness and isolation and sink into the rhythm of animal joy. And you are part of that animal joy as it... Do you recognise this animal joy in yourself? Well, this is a... It's a very important question, how we relate to the animal in us. Uh, and um, there are one way is to deny it, the way of the, of the monk, uh, the ascetic. And that way is no longer very easily available mm -hmm. in the modern world. 
Another way is to allow it to swamp us and dominate us and be the only fact about us, which is the way of, um, alas, of many young people today. It's the way of, of sexual liberty and um, the, you know, the indulgence of appetite above everything else. And that, of course, again, allows the animal in us to, to take over and, and be in charge. My own view is that you can't, you should not deny it. You should use it to, uh, if you like, to give added poignancy to your existence as a self-conscious being. And the best way is for to take hold of these fundamental animal experiences and make of them something more sublime, more architectural, more aesthetic than they otherwise would be. This is, after For instance, all, give me an example. I was just going to give you an example. A romantic love is a very good example of this, um, and indeed is one of the great cultural achievements of our civilization. If you look at uh, medieval literature yeah. uh, of Chaucer and Dante and Petrarch and so on, you, late medieval literature, you see this immense effort, intellectual, moral, spiritual, uh, which was devoted to the great cause of lifting erotic experience out of the animal realm and making it into a, a kind of spiritual principle, mm -hmm. uh, setting it in stained glass. And uh, um, it worked. It, it worked in the sense that it set an ideal of love between the sexes at the centre of our civilization in a way that no other civilization has achieved. And it changed in all kinds of ways our conception of marriage, a conception of uh, what the childbearing really is, and of course uh, it, um, produced the greatest um, collection of poetry and music that the world yeah. has ever known. So there is one example. Hunting is a smaller example of this. You return to the animal experience, but at the same time you're rescuing that experience uh, and, as it were, recreating it at the self-conscious level as a, as a ceremony, a rejoicing, a celebration of your being in nature rather than a mere being in nature. It is close to your definition of consciousness, transforming the animal yes. into something better or something else. But into something well, we, do, we don't want to say something better, but something else. Something else, something that's aware of itself. Yeah. <coughs> now, let me just refuel on the tea. Um, I can't really smoke and just speak at the same time. So you want to smoke or want? Let <laughs> me have a few parts of the cigar. Is that enough on religion? We could go on to talk about beauty. We haven't actually said anything about that. But uh, okay. We'll come back to religion later, I think. Yeah. I wonder... Oliver Sacks, you know him, mm. once said to me, once we were supposed... I'm coming back to your childhood for a while. Mm. Once we were supposed to live in, a, in an archaic state, mm. our childhood, and mm. the rest of our lives we are busy recapturing that Arcadia, Mm. Although perhaps it never existed. Mm. Does that apply to you, more or less? <coughs> oh, well, I, uh, I was very fortunate... We're, we're talking about purity now, yeah, yeah. in childhood. I was very fortunate in having an unhappy childhood, um, so that my f desire from the very beginning was to escape from it. So I never actually had that sense of Arcadia. My childhood home was one of violence and quarrels and discord and um, perhaps of course is, this has given me a, a, an un, underlying sense that there was something missing and I must recreate it but always from the beginning of my life I was aware that I had to create this consolation for myself there was nothing to go back to it wasn't there in my childhood not at all well it was pretty well destroyed anyway I'm sure there was some stage and some remove, um, but it wasn't something which uh, I felt to be reliable. I had no 
uh, sense that I could simply give up, turn back from the adult world and rediscover that um, uh, soothing air of mother love that so many people of my generation used to know. I knew that... You didn't know it? Well, it was, it was anxiety. Only as a desire? I, I, of course, there were... Uh, uh, it was there, it was planted in me because my mother loved me, but her, it, her life was very difficult, the home was very difficult, there was immense conflict, and I ran away from it when, it, when I was 16, as soon as I could, as soon as I'd finished school. Conflicts about what? Well, just, you know, sort of things that parents conflict about. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was nothing relevant to me now, but it meant that I went out quite anxious into the world, but nevertheless thinking that there's nothing that good that can happen to me except by me going on and making it happen out of my own energy. Uh, and I knew, however, that um, because I was not stupid, I knew that any idea of consolation that we have must relate also to the deep feelings in us, the deep desire for homecoming. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, I was in the business of making a home, um, which would be my doing. But, uh, at the same time, I was very much aware of the difference between me and everybody else. Um, not everybody, but met most of the people I met. That, that there was something in me that was in need of of a there was something in me that needed to be addressed. If you like, I had the I had a question in my life. I didn't know what the question was, but I knew that, that it needed an answer, and I had first to identify what the question was. And um, so, the things that my contemporaries took pleasure in like football or cinema or, or uh, whatever it might be, um, pop music, had, had very little significance for me. Even though, like every, all my contemporaries, of course I played the guitar and played bass guitar and a pop group and all the usual things one had to do. Um, but even while doing it, I regarded myself as just as ridiculous as the people around me. You had a question, hmm. but you didn't know. I didn't know what it was. Kind of. No, I didn't know what it was. Uh, but you know, someone like Heidegger would say it was the question of being: um, yeah. what and why am I? And I suppose that that is part of it. It gradually became more concrete, uh, and it, in, in, indeed, it really was the question of what is this soul doing in this environment and how can it possibly come to be in that environment in a way that will uh, bring peace to itself? That was the question. What I now realize is that I was, I was beginning to live in a questioning mode. You know? There was no one question, but that everything was going to be for me a question. And I would eventually need something like a philosophy which would enable me to understand the difference between living well in this world and living badly. And that's what I suppose all my efforts as a writer have been devoted to the attempt to describe what this difference is. The fear of life has been a factor for me and um, learning to live without fear of living has been the big the, the discipline that I've set myself. Fear of living. Can you give us some examples? You talked about your childhood. Yes. Um, very well, simple examples. Um, being afraid to give up. A career, for instance, that I thought to be certain. Uh, but yes, that I thought to be certain and secure, um, but I knew that I should give it up because it was not me, my career as a teacher. 
I finally got the courage to give it up, but um, I left it very late. And um, that's one small example of being afraid to move to this place. It, that's a simple thing. But being afraid also to go out and do things which I felt I should do um, because there was a risk attached. Being afraid of people, being afraid of friendships, being afraid also of enemies. All these, these are fears which I've had and um, had to discipline myself to overcome. And um, this re is relevant to the theme of consolation because it, when you're confronted with this sort of fear, you might run from it into false consolations, things which are not real consolations because they involve no overcoming. Such as? Drink yeah. um, is a very good one. I mean, I've always had a deep sympathy with wine. Uh, it, it, to me, it's um, one of God's greatest gifts. And um, the proof of the Christian religion is that it's made it into God itself. Um, but that, I suppose, is a Greek influence. But um, I can see what it would be to take refuge in wine completely um, and allow that to soothe one through one's day and soothe one through one's inadequacies. And... Um, to enable one to put this fear to one side. That is not a consolation. A consolation to me comes from having confronted trouble and elicited from the heart of trouble the resolution of it. That's why I said earlier that the Beethoven quartets are for me such an important instance of, of consolation because they are living images in sound of this process whereby conflict and fragmentation and pain are overcome and brought to a serene resolution. If you're talking about fear, fear for humans, other human beings, mm. friendships, uh, fear for almost everything as you described it, mm. the world itself, your career, breaking up your career, can you describe what fear are you talking about? Are you talking about a period of, in my life of us panicking, real panicking, mm. for two and a half years, mm. every second, trying yes. to get away from it, didn't succeed. Fear was running with me. Is it mm. that kind of feeling, or what is it? <coughs> yes, that's, that's that kind of feeling, and it's a, the normal feeling, as far as one can see, of the modern world. If you look at most modern novels, this uh, panic of of the isolated individual, alone fending for itself and knowing it's not able to, is the, the central theme of modern literature. Yeah. And um, only here and there is that um, panic overcome, resolved in, in some acceptance or transcendence which makes the, 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 the trouble worthwhile. If I say, you have to overcome oceans of suffering before you see a glimpse of beauty and consolation. Mm. This Calvinist imagery. Mm. It does apply a little bit to you. Well, I s no, I would say that I glimpsed or very, very strongly saw beauty and the possibility of consolation that came with it long before, you know, I was personally consoled. Um, but I saw the effort, and that the effort was worthwhile. But it's a very, it, it's been my own effort, and it's a very special kind of effort. I don't think it has anything to, very much to do with, with other examples, with my predecessors. Um, um, I will I'll say why. I, I think I have always worked very hard at my literary uh, gifts, but in every direction that they've, suge they've suggested, both philosophical, 
essays, fiction, anything that seems to come to, to my pen. But it's always been an enormous work, and I've always connected it deliberately with um, my subjectivity, the peculiar confusion which I inherited by being born the thing that I was. And uh, I made it, I made them slaves, my, my literary works, of my, dis my need. They were, and each of them had the task of unraveling some of this confusion, putting, giving it objective form, or taking it out of me, or taking me out of it. Um, and it wasn't none of, except for a few academic articles and that sort of thing. Uh, all this has been a completely personal voyage of discovery. But it has also been addressed to the world because it wouldn't be meaningful otherwise. It's it's been I've been saying to the world, hey, look, I exist. Um, does it matter or doesn't it? You know, I wanted a response, and uh, the clarity of as I as my words became more clear, then others recognized my existence through them, and I began to recognize my existence through them, and become more humble and acquiescent in what I was, and recognize that I am, as I said before, that I am just one person among many, both the most important and the least important thing that there is. So this was a, a personal thing, which wasn't um, had nothing to do with the normal building of an academic mm. philosopher. You know, my life was a kind of Bildungsroman, really, um, in which the academic part was a sort of continuous and enjoyable mistake. You know, I wasn't, I shouldn't have been a teacher, or I shouldn't have been locked away in libraries. My heart and soul have always been in other things. I've always been involved in other things which have always been more important and I've been feeding what I really think. But it was useful to have all those books and discuss all those things with my colleagues and acquire a competence in their field too. I, I find it is very satisfying to understand the intellectual structure of a philosophical problem and to have a philosophical overview of a problem that is not in itself philosophical. Uh, that is very satisfying. But being satisfied intellectually is not the same as being consoled. Being consoled means being at one with something and finding your place of rest there. And that's not something that I do find very easily with philosophy. Uh, the philosophers that I've most in that I owe most to intellectually um, are Kant and Wittgenstein, I suppose, neither of whom I find consoling to read, although I suppose Kant's moral philosophy in the end is sublime. And it does give one a vision of what is possible and so has something of that console consoling power. But uh, that, in Plato too, I mean, obviously in the last days of Socrates, the last dialogues about Socrates, you see a, a wonderful image of what philosophy might be mm -hmm. by way of a, a rising, a raising of you above the mortal concerns and a, an irradiation of the soul by a divine light. And that is a, a wonderful vision, but it very rarely comes to you just through philosophy alone. On the other hand, I would hate to be without philosophy, because I know that I wouldn't understand many things that I need to understand in order to live, as it were, in friendship with myself. And that task... You're describing it more or less, and this is not the first time, as a kind of therapy. Yes. Mm, it's not just a therapy, but, uh, um, because after all... A means to an end. Uh, mm, Philosophy is also a search for the truth about matters which are in which the truth is hidden. It's a hard discipline. What are the answers until now? <coughs> Assembling what kind of a picture of human beings you have after so many years, so many centuries of philosophy. 
I mean, are we any closer to any answer? Mm. It's a very good question. Uh, my, I suppose... I suppose he, I would say that, with Spinoza, that the truth of our condition is very difficult to understand. And like everything worthy of knowledge, it's as difficult as it is rare, as he says at the end of the ethics. Um, we won't, we, we achieve understanding anew in every epoch, and it takes the greatest of intellectual and cultural effort to do it. Um, this is what civilization is for, to achieve this self-understanding. But it does seem to be the case that no sooner has it been achieved and it's lost again, uh, and that the, the knowledge that really matters is more easily lost than, than gained. We can gain easily piecemeal knowledge of this and that, um, and build up whole libraries of piecemeal knowledge. But the, um, the conception of the why and what of human existence dawns on people only at the apex of their endeavours. And once it has dawned, it is usually then eclipsed straight away by ignorance. And we are going through a period of eclipse that is quite obvious. We're entering a dark age in which people will know an awful lot of information, but very little coherent, holistic truth. And this has happened before, many times. But the wonderful thing is that it's still possible to gain a vision, to stand on a little peak, not perhaps the peak on which, say, Spinoza stood, or Plato, but nevertheless a peak of one's own, and look across at all this uh, sea of ignorance and confusion and hysteria and smile at it. Compared to the 14, 15 year old mm. looking for the question, did you succeed in finding some uh, reasonable or consoling answers concerning your own childhood? Hmm till the moment you left home? I wasn't, no, I mean... Was part of the enterprise reconciliation? Yes. With that childhood? In the end, yes, reconciliation with everything. Um, there is a, an image of consolation which has been very influential in, in our civilization, in particular in the modern period, which you find in Hegel and Hölderlin and the romantics generally, but also in people like Marx, of a, a, an initial condition of oneness, uh, what, what Hegel called unmediated unity, um, from which we diverge fr by some outward going process, objectification, entfremdung, and so on. And then we overcome that and, uh, through a dialectical uh, synthesis and rediscover that original oneness but in a as it were transformed and self-conscious state mm -hmm. and that's the the image that that drives Hegel's philosophy and it's a very powerful image of course it has its origins in the myth of the paradise of paradise and the fall and the redemption and which is perhaps a myth far deeper than any one religion it goes to the heart of, uh, of what we are. And I suppose the true power of religion is that it makes death itself into that final redemption so that you do come home at the very moment when you leave all your sufferings behind. Now, I, without going into that religious uh, expectation and hope, I think that in this world, once you've seen, uh, once you've experienced this fragmentation and alienation, which intellectuals always do feel, that you're under an obligation then to look for that process of reconciliation, whereby you rediscover the oneness which you once had, or perhaps, if you've never had it, that you invent it for yourself. 
You are infallible. Yeah. And I think that you must do that, otherwise you're a trouble to others. Um, intellectuals in particular are a trouble to others when they haven't <coughs> achieved that serenity in themselves. And that's what, going back to what we were talking about earlier, that's what it seems to me is the real evil in people like Lenin and Hitler, is that uh, the trouble in themselves is something which they have not regarded as their own problem but projected it onto the world and wanted to find, by reorganizing the world, the unity and serenity that they could only ever find in themselves. Mm. And uh, my view is that we're under an obligation, once we understand this, to find that serenity in ourselves, so as no longer to be a threat to others. Did you find it? Yes. Serenity? Yeah. Describe it, because it's one of the key words to beauty mm. and consolation. Right. But serenity comes, uh, you know, I could to define it. Hmm. Can I have a little Describe break? Describe it. Want to have a little break? Yeah, a little okay. break. Sereniteit, vreemd woord, bijna archaïs. Zo'n woord dat langzaam in onbruik raakt en tenslotte alleen in het woordenboek nog overleeft. Maar in de boeken van Scruton floreert het woord. Daar wordt het in ere hersteld. Sereniteit. We zullen erop terugkomen met muzikale begeleiding. Maar eerst nog staat God op de agenda. De noodzaak van de religie, haar troost. De religie die van de dood een thuiskomst maakt. De eeuwigheid is onze herder. I play the organ in church every Sunday because I'm I, I'm the organist here in the village. So I play always play Bach then, um, but my fingers are too rusty to play. Bach very well. Uh, Beethoven has always been a great love. Chopin too. And um, Mozart. Waar vind je nog een filosoof vandaag de dag die ongegeneerd in God gelooft? Althans, in de noodzaak van het geloof in God. Die organist is in een plattelandskerk en die de schoonheid en troost van de religie bezingt in nogal wat toonaarde. Die filosoof vind je in Wiltshire, Engeland. We live in a difficult world, a world full of threats. I know that I must die. Um, you know, I, I, I need to face up to that particular fact. I know that that the civilization in which I live is in a very unhealthy and distressed state, um, without knowing why, that it's lost all conception of of its own unhappiness, so to speak. And um, these are difficult things to live with, and you need consolation for these. And this is where, of course, beauty is so important. The, not only beauty, uh, religion is important to me, uh, though very much, uh, as it were, on the field of my, on the periphery of my field of vision, but it's always there. What do you mean by religion? What is your... I talk about religious feelings. Religion as a metaphor for... Religious feelings. Feelings that, that this world is not complete in itself. 
that there is something upon which it depends and towards which it tends, which is greater than it, but which we can't put into words. And that, that God feeling, I think that's all important. It's, uh, it helps one as well to see clearly what things matter and what things don't. I, I'm very concerned that you know, people have, having lost this God feeling, the sense, as I just described, of there being something greater in the world on which it depends and towards which it is aimed. Having lost that, people are totally at sea with, when any major collective emotion comes into play. And we saw that with the ridiculous hysteria over Princess Diana. We see it in thousands of ways. And uh, you know, hysteria dominates national politics now. And it do dominates, alas, the um, dealings between nations. And I fear that uh, the, the only channel for these collective feelings, which enables us to maintain moral equilibrium in the midst of them is that which is provided by the sense of the divine and as people lose that sense because they lose their attachment to any formal religion in which it is rehearsed and made real then they become prey to superstition on the most appalling kind I think it's no accident that the loss of faith in our century immediately was accompanied by the rise of totalitarian government, uh, communism and Nazism and fascism, all of which are atheistic creeds growing out of that superstitions, which would grow out of people's loss of any sense of the Godhead. So I'm, to me, a, a return, a constant return to that sense is absolutely vital. If I'm to retain, maintain a moral equilibrium. Is that the reason or <coughs> Are you just wanting to uh, re-establish the picture, the mental picture of well, God or the God? It's there in me, uh, and I have to rehearse it all the time, because uh, I think otherwise it, modern life would be unbearable. I see it, uh, you know, it, it, it would be a source of great unhappiness to see people adrift as they are, without and um, to be adrift with them. You know, I would. It would be very disturbing for me. So I have to. I'm constantly trying to re-establish equilibrium in the midst of this, and try also to, to say in public, what that equilibrium is. It doesn't make you popular, of course. No, God. We got rid of him finally. Mm, well, uh, we finally recognized that we were totally alone in the universe. Mm. Oceans of time before us, yes. oceans of time after us, mm. Schopenhauer, yeah, and mm. the mist we were, yes, giving meaning to our lives, just one little second in eternity, mm. and now you're coming <coughs> up with God again. In three or four minutes, you're talking about a moral God, or not? Yes, I'm. Uh, yes, I'm talking. I'm not talking the language of old-fashioned theology, but I am saying that the experience that I'm referring to is implanted in all of us, and if we deny it. Uh, then we are completely at sea, and the, uh, you only have to look at 20th century history to see the truth of that. Uh, it doesn't, um, you know, it's a deep metaphysical question what this experience actually means. Um, and I, st I'm one of the things that occupies me all the time. But not to revisit that experience is dangerous. And people don't revisit it, just that so they don't revisit so much of them, their own selves because it frightens them but um, you know sometimes a certain measure of awe and fear are imp are appropriate but I wouldn't say of course that this is part of consolation exactly but it's it's a, an equilibrating device we live in a world of total disequilibrium and whenever affected by it we need to restore ourselves well, we should restore ourselves. So I go through restorative attempts of this kind. What do you have any mental image of God, the eternal machine, or whatever? No, a mental image is not. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm very much of Spinoza's persuasion that imagery always will falsify mm -hmm. uh, the deity. Um, and um, one should learn to live beyond imagery. What kind of a personality is he, she? It, only by revelation can you really grasp this, because you're trying to grasp the whole of things, whereas we are only given insight into tiny parts. Uh, but why not take the experience that we have of each other and say, at least in this little part, I can see how personality shines through mere things, as it does when I look into the eyes of somebody whom I really love. Why not think of it in that way? You might say, this is what was meant by those who said that man was made in the image of God, whoever it was who wrote the book of Genesis. Oh, now we're running into trouble, aren't we? If I look into the eyes of Joseph Goebbels. Mm -hmm. Well... We're well, talking about the image of God. You are, but you're also talking about a freedom that has been abused, aren't you? You blame Joseph Goebbels for what he is, but in doing so, you must also recognize that he freely cho chose to do something evil. Yes, and? Well, that sort of freedom you also want to attribute, also will have to attribute to God. Now, the question is, uh, you're going to ask is, well, uh, are we sure that God used his, pre his freedom as he should? All I can say is that you have to understand what the difference is between something bad or something seeming to be bad happening and something evil being done. All the evil in the world, uh, in my view, is traceable to human choice. Bad things happen, but they're not in themselves evil. When somebody dies, it's a bad thing for him. But if, unless he was murdered, that's not an evil. I don't want to exonerate God either. It's not my business to um, produce a, a theodicy. I just want to say how it should be seen. God leaves mankind some freedom for decision making. Mm. Why does he, she do it? It's got omnipotent, almighty, mm. or not, in your... Freedom... Freedom is a precondition of love, isn't it? You couldn't love something That's if you thought it was an automaton. You all know the, the story of Olympia, in that Hoffman, E.T.A. Hoff, e. Hoffman tells, yeah. you remember, in um, uh, that wonderful story called The Sandman, Olympia the doll that's wound up and uh, inspires love in the romantic, deluded poet. Um, of course, the, the whole point of this story is that if you ever did come to see somebody in that way, uh, love becomes ridiculous. Love towards the automaton, brilliantly uh, put across by Offenbach in Tales of Hoffman. I don't know if you know that opera. Um, well, likewise with human being, if you ever did lose the belief in their freedom, then it would be impossible to love them. And it, one assumes, I'm, I'm not a theologian, and I don't want to talk theology, but one assumes that it's an elementary truth of theology, that God created us free in order that we should love him, and that he should love us. And uh, if what would be the point of creating a load of automata just to play around with dolls? Are you talking about a kind of Socinian god? A god evolving with us in time? Um, Not only a, a god who wants to be loved, but a kind of Humpty Dumpty who has to be held. No. I, 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 he, the question is... He has no need of us, except insofar as he has a need 
to love. He created us in order to be loved. But to say he created us, of course, is to say that we're not part of him, which we are. Um, we are part of that thing which he is. This is a very Spinoza's conception I'm putting across. Let, yeah. Put it this way, I don't have a, a clear theological conception, such as a, a priest or a... Uh, um, a doctor of the faith would have. I can't answer all these questions. If we see our presence in the universe at this very moment in time for 60 or 70 or 80 years as one whisper, and we can't give meaning to our own lives because there are no preconditions, there is no God, there is no moral hmm. statement in the universe itself, of the universe itself. Isn't that more challenging? and returning to the old idea of a moral God who needs us to. Mm. If you want to live your life being challenged, that's fine, but... Um, you want to be consoled? Yes. Uh, um, no, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of things which are more challenging than my worldview, um, but it doesn't follow that they're, for that reason, more true. Uh, and most, there are, it's possible for someone uh, of like Rilke to live with a kind of death of God feeling, mm -hmm. to say to himself, for God has been taken from the world along with so much else. I will now remake everything according to my own inner light and find consolation there. And to some extent, that's what I do. But um, not everybody is Rilke. Most people deprived of this kind of consolation don't live, don't rise to the challenge at all. They sink a long way beneath it and uh, li live without that aspiration to be something better that they would otherwise have had. Um, so I'm not, I'm very much opposed to taking this sort of thing away from people. If you lose it yourself, then of course that could be regarded as a misfortune or you might regard it as a great liberation as mm -hmm. Nietzsche tried to do but that's your problem you deal with it and you know I have my own way of dealing with it and I think I have dealt with it and worked my way back to something nothing not really the god of organized religion or anything like that but I've worked my way back to something like the God idea, I'm giving it a, a place in my life which enables me to stand to some extent in judgment on myself, as I think I should. If I say afterlife... Hmm. Oh, it, that's a mystery. It's the same mystery as time itself, isn't it? I, what what we are, we are only he here and now. Yeah. But here and now is also eternal when properly experienced. It is, Mr. Scruton, but after 60 or 70 years, you're dead mm. and buried. Mm. That's it. The world goes on, mm. reality goes on, time mm. goes on. That may very well be true. But... Um, Look at it in another way. That, those 70 years that were given to you under subspatia eternitatis, they haven't been taken from reality. Nobody in the future is going to revisit them. But you will revisit them because they are yours. You won't revisit them in time, but that time is yours and is yours eternally. And this is what Nietzsche should have meant by eternal recurrence, yeah. that you should live each moment of your life, not as though it were a fleeting moment, but as though it were eternally there, fixed, made what it is, but fixed, as it were, in another dimension. And that is a consoling thought, because after all, in this time, 
in time as we experience it. After death, you are no more, and therefore you lose nothing, nor do you gain anything. Mm -hmm. um, and there is nothing for you to miss. But in these 70 years, you have everything, and it will be there always. Those are your 70 years. And um, how to envisage that? You can't envisage that without you. You can't envisage those 70 years from a point of view outside them, mm. in which you are not. Any perspective that you can have on them is a perspective which will show them to be eternally there with you. And you will never lose them, except by losing yourself. So it's up to you to live them well. And um, when Dr. Faustus in Christopher Marlowe's play says, this is hell, nor am I out of it, that's what he means. His, his pact with the devil has translated his world into hell by the very fact that it's now based upon uh, a compromise of his being a surrender of his freedom to some to a, to a force which he detests. Anyway, <coughs> that's slightly mystical, but um, what's the point of philosophy if it doesn't enable you to say mystical things? No. Why is it that so many people are lying after a wonderful paradise, an afterlife, eternity? Do we understand it? Mm. Well, I'm not talking mm. about the, the view of Nietzsche now. I'm talking about the everyday yes. view of people coming to a church, longing for eternity, an eternal life. Well, it's a, a parable of that eternity is what it they have. It seems to be a, a looking for consolation, mm. is it? Yes, um, of course. When people lose that longing for paradise, they start instead longing to win the national lottery or something. They engage okay. in vulgar, secular versions of it. I mean, it's in all of our nature to long for the compensation for what we have not had and to think that finally they'll be given to us that which we've always wanted. Um, but it may be that um, that is the only way that many people can live properly, by holding in front of themselves this ideal and uh, trying to earn it. But uh, of course it doesn't stand up very easily to examination. But there's nothing vulgar or silly in wanting that. And after all, the greatest trial that all human beings have to confront is that of death, how, how to accept the fact that, you know, that I will die. What is it that I, how should I think of myself in order to do that? I've just given a way of thinking of it, which makes it easy, easier for you, people like you and me, to confront this. But it wasn't, wouldn't make it easier for many people they need something else. The concept of consolation that we have is influenced through and through by the Christian religion, which is, after all, the foundation of a civilization, and it's what glows in the embers of Hegel's philosophy, too. And this presented us with this extraordinary image of consolation through loss in the death of God himself on the cross, and most extraordinary voluntary renunciation of this life in the, and acceptance of the most painful form of death, um, which in itself perhaps has a tragic quality to it, but also um, is a redemptive story. It's a story about the redemption of the soul through this uh, repudiation of earthly things. Mm -hmm. It has been the, the central image of consolation in our tradition, and it's yeah, the most and extraordinary it's idea. 
for you it remains a kind of ultimate symbol of yes of a set, yes uh, the, that and why that there is a a path of renunciation which is also an acceptance it's not a path that i have the strength to take why should we accept father forgive them come on but why should we not accept when when we have to there's there's two we have two choices one is to go towards our end accepting it the other, the other is to be dragged kicking and screaming towards it but it's the same outcome either way the only thing that we have the freedom to do is to achieve the serenity beforehand which comes from willing sacrifice so i think that um, you know this is a, a model of rational conduct mm -hmm. Now, that's enough of that subject. <laughs> We kunnen sereniteit bereiken, zolang we onszelf willen opofferen. Daar is het weer. Dat woord dat al bijna middeleeuws lijkt, maar dat voor Scruton een sleutelwoord is geworden. Is dit sereen genoeg? Een verre buurman die hooi aan de riek steekt en het verbrandt. De rook die over de daken het dal in waaiert. Scruton vraagt of hij al piano moet spelen. Nog niet, zometeen. Laten we eerst terugkeren naar dat ene woord. Dan komt de muziek vanzelf. En met de muziek mee komt Sophie. Let maar op. Ook al ligt ze, terwijl we direct en indirect over haar praten, boven Sikopet. To be serene is to be untroubled not because one has had no trouble, but because one has understood one's trouble, come to terms with it, and with a measure of humility, recognize that uh, one is not so important, that that trouble really matters. And you come to, you become serene as soon as you see that not only are you the most important thing in the world, but you are also the least important thing. Um, that you're the most important thing to you because you are all that you have, but you're also no more important than that, than that implies. Uh, and gradually, I think it's possible for somebody like me who's been deeply troubled by the world and by his own experience nevertheless to become reconciled to all that by seeing that he is only one little center of consciousness among many that nevertheless a, a center of consciousness that has tried to make itself interesting to itself and um, then gradually learning to look at others and see that they are more important uh, obviously love of another person is a great help in bringing about this serenity. But I could never have achieved that love of another person without also the assistance that I've got from art and music, because they give me an absolutely clear perception that there are souls in the world which are far more interesting than mine, which have also lived through troubles and found out of found in the heart of trouble the seeds of uh, harmony and finally this uh, restfulness with the self who is the self roger scruton could you define yourself roughly i've just done so in all these things i've yeah, been what saying what you do mm. who you are who i am I can't define it, no. I, 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 not in so many. How, how would you define yourself? All I can do is point to the trajectory of my life and say that this is, you know, I, this is how I came to be what I am. And um, 
what I am, you've seen today, it consists in many different aspects of a life, all of which cohere about one single thing, which is I. But how to put that into any other words, I don't know. I. Hmm. That's it. In the dark periods of your existence now, where are you looking for consolation? Which century? <coughs> what kind of music? What kind of poetry? Or well, are you just cooking, for instance? Yes, I love cooking. If, if, um, that's yeah, I want to be a more simple, yeah. oh, well, a little more do, ordinary. Okay, consolation. My day-to-day -day consolations as a, uh, are very. I can tell you all the uh, well. It's, some of them. My principal consolation is my wife, um, who is, uh, I suppose, the first and most important object of affection in my life, and has changed my life. So we were only recently married, and um, it's only recently that I've had the confidence, really, to take that kind of joy in another person as well. Did um, you ever had it before? Did well, you I lose it or? I'm not sure. First time? I have been married before, but it was not consoling. Um, but this is. Um, and um, but that's a, a very different. I mean, obviously, everybody can point to the personal relation in their life, which is the. Hard well, what's the consoling part of your personal relationship to your wife now? Well, there's so many parts, but perhaps the most important thing is that she is more important than me. And um, her feelings are constantly my concern. And that, of course, is a very consoling thing, because it means you have a reason. And in all your own experience, you have a reason to say, stop thinking about yourself. That is not as important. Why is she more important than you are? Well, that's what love is, isn't it? There isn't any clear answer to this. I mean, it is when you recognize that someone is more important than you that you decide that, that you have to, as it were, if you can, bind your two lives together. But I wouldn't feel that about her if she didn't feel it about me. She's feeling the same way. Yeah, but in her own but rather <laughs> different way. But that that is one source of consolation. But doesn't bear on all these other things that we were yeah, talking about. Yeah, but you were about. talking about transformation mm. earlier. Vulgarity, the ordinarity, into mm. a better yes. example of the world. Is, does the same apply to the love you feel for your new wife now? Yes. Uh, um, I mean, this is a, a, a rational act of transformation in order to... Um, there is a, a point where where reason expires, where a choice ceases to be rational. You, re, you should use reason up to the point where it, its writ ceases to run. Uh, and of course, in anything like marriage or, or any personal relation, there's a, a great deal that you need to think about. But at a certain point, you've exhausted all the reasons for and against. And it's at that point only that life takes over and becomes a supremely important thing. But it is the life of a self-conscious being that's involved. It's not just an animal life. Uh, I'm, one of the, I'm a great believer in marriage as an example of what we were talking about earlier, of the, our capacity to lift our experience out of the animal realm and, as it were, inscribe it into the eternal. Marriage has properly understood that idea built into it. It is not a promise to stay together while the going is good. It's a vow whose meaning is eternal. And even if you break it, it, it remains with you. And um, to have this sense in front of another person that you're both prepared to do this is to automatically to lift all that day-to-day -day routine out of routine into something sublime 
that, uh, it's, and it has partly an aesthetic, partly a moral, and partly a spiritual meaning. And that's why, you know, during the 60s, people used to pour scorn on marriage as a humdrum day-to-day -day thing, and that is the opposite of the truth. Your modern uh, forms of cohabitation, drifting from one relationship to another, uh, um, perhaps even with uh, all kinds of embellishments and infidelities, that is what's humdrum and ordinary, because the decision has never been made to lift yourself out of this routine into something which casts judgment on it, so to speak, and looks at it from a transcendental perspective. So nothing that happens in marriage is drudgery or meaningless or simply routine. Everything is part of a creative endeavor to be something higher than yourself. So that is one of my consolations, and you know, there's many very little that can isn't compare it, with that. Isn't it enough? The way you're describing indirectly your wife, the relationship with her, mm. I think, oh, great. Mm. This is enough. Your wonderful house in Wiltshire. Mm. You have your bear treat chair. Yes, and my horses. So, and your horses. Yes, yeah, so we can bring the whole conversation to an end. <laughs> <laughs> Play a little bit of Beethoven yeah. and we're finished. Yeah. He was a really happy man. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I've managed to preserve a sufficient core of unhappiness to give a piquancy to my <laughs> pleasures. And this is the first time you saw your wife. And I, I, I first saw my wife out hunting. I was introduced to her just two, three years ago. When I flew back, I was teaching in Boston at the time, and I flew back here one Friday night from and to go hunting on the Saturday morning and we were introduced out in the hunting field. I didn't really pay much attention to her except that four weeks later I fell off my horse and um, and uh, she came and helped me and picked me up and put me back on it again. So we became very good friends then and um, gradually I came to feel you know this some of her naturalness began to rub up, off on me. You, know, you so discovered her slowly. Yeah. The yes, vice versa? Hmm? Vice yes, versa. yes, it's very slow, quiet, um, respectful courtship. Um, but I always, from the beginning, felt that she did embody some of the serenity that I was looking for. She presented me an image of serenity in herself, which I tried to transcribe in a little portrait into music, into a little piano piece, um, which uh, would convey something of her composure and orderliness, and um, also hint at what she is in her appearance. It contains a little quotation from Debussy, from the a few or cheveux de la, mm -hmm. um, because she has flaxen hair too. What is um, it called, this particular piece for you? Uh, Boreas blows not. It's a quotation from Herodotus. Boreas, mm -hmm. the north wind, blows not through the young virgin who lives alone in the house with her mother. Because at the time, Sophie was living alone in the house with, the, with her mother, so it was a description of of Boreas, the north wind, refusing to blow, you know, um, or unable to blow through this little secure little cottage.
Oh shit, I flashed out that bit just from there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> stupid I knew that any idea of consolation that we have must relate also to the deep feelings in us the deep desire for homecoming so from the beginning I was in the business of making a home um, which would be my doing detached house um, by a railway line um, in which we were you know very poor um, very much um, living in the old under the under the shadow of the old class resentments of the English it was um, a world of darkness or twilight it was a twilight world and it had nothing to do with this. This is um, this here is created by books and music in the middle of a countryside which I love, and among people doing innocent, old-fashioned things with animals. That's as far as one can get. Full of mistakes, but. 